Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about GLX and sort of the history of where that, what it is, where it came from, um, and and how it's uh, how we've kind of bolted it for uh, bolted it into the X server and uh, and modified it over the years and, and what's you know various features that have happened. Um, sort of an archaeological tour, and I'm going to end with you know things that we've been doing very recently and kind of where we want to see uh, future future work for. Um, for extending the GLX support and why that's important for the X server and, and its success in, in general. Um, if anybody, if I, I'm kind of going to go in chronological order, so if it seems like I'm missing something or if I, if it seems like I'm glossing over something, please just shout, let me know. So what exactly is this thing? Um, OpenGL is just a rendering API. All it really does is uh, it, it, def it has the notion of various buffers, your front buffer, your back buffer, depth, accumulation, stencil. Um, but it doesn't actually define how you get them, and it doesn't define how you get bits between them. That's all up in the Windows system. The Windows system layer is GLX on the X window system. It's Wiggle on Windows. It's AGL or CGL on Apple. Um, there's a thing called EGL for embedded platforms that sort of you can pretend you don't have to know what the Windows system is under you, and you really do. Um, so GLX is the glue between, okay, you've got OpenGL rendering, you would like it to show up on an X server in an X window or to an off-screen surface, an X pix map. So GLX defines how you do that. It's, uh, it's got the uh, X as a concept of visuals, which, it, which Windows calls pixel formats, uh, which basically says you know, eight bits per channel of red, green, and blue, whether or not there's alpha present. Um, GLX extends this concept to include, is there a back buffer or not? Is there an accumulation buffer? Is, are there depth buffers? If they are, how many bits in each do you get? Um, so GLX adds that. Um, GL also, GLX also defines the interaction between GL rendering and, and, X, and all the other X rendering. So those command streams are asynchronous. And so if you want to draw some stuff with GL and then overlay some X text on top of it using the X font renderer, you can do that. Probably shouldn't. If you do, uh, there, there's explicit synchroniz synchronization calls for waiting for X rendering to complete or waiting for GL rendering to complete. That's in GLX. Um, everything else really to do with presentation lives in GLX. So. I want to swap buffers and I want them to present with a particular timestamp. I want them to come out at this moment. That's in GL because it's a Windows system, op GLX, that's because it's a Windows system operation. The Windows system knows about that presentation. Um, there's things like uh, if you have multiple applications that all want to swap at the same time, you can add swap groups, which are another GLX extension. So multiple applications can all post a swap and it won't actually happen until the last one in the group has swapped. and then. They all swap at once. So anything that involves the window system and its interaction with the GL is in GLX. Unusually, it's, it's an X extension, which means that inside the X protocol, there's a sort of a substream that is the GLX commands. Unusually for, a GLX, for an X extension, it defines two ways that the rendering commands can actually be executed. And these are called direct, this is, it depends on the graphics context, that's called that. You either get a direct or an indirect context. Indirect contexts are the same as everything else in X, where the commands get fed over to the X server, it interprets them, sends them down to the hardware. That's not especially performant. If you have a lot of texture memory, then you have to copy all of that over the Unix socket and hand it to the X server, and then that has to feed it down to the, to the pipe, so to the hardware. So as an optimization, there's direct context where there's this negotiation between the X client and the X server about, okay, the client's going to send commands directly to the hardware, and we're going to negotiate and sort of arbitrate and make sure they don't stomp on each other. So that's, so GLX defines the concepts of direct and indirect contexts and how they interact. Um, different contexts can share some objects if they, like they can share textures or vertex lists if they're in the same address space. So if you have multiple indirect contexts in the X server, they can all share the same textures, 
multiple direct contexts you can't do that. And two different direct clients only get their own set of objects. So there's that, uh, that level of semantics. It's all defined inside, the GL, inside of GLX. It's worth remembering that GL predates X. Uh, GL came about, it does. It does. Keith is looking at me as though it's a lie, but it really what does. Year? Sorry? What year did GL start? I would have to go back and look at that, but whenever the Irish GL came out, which was... was like 87, 88. Yeah, so GLX is like... The, you said GL pre precedes X. It does, because, I, because GL was written, GL does predate X, because GL was written for... Well, sure, but X another was developed system. in parallel at a different organization. Sorry. GL's, GL predates GLX is probably a better way to, to say that. It was written for another Windows system called Iris and then ported to X. Fair. Well, that can't be true because X term predates X. Uh, uh. Um, so you get the sensation reading the, uh, the GLX code that the people who wrote it knew a lot about the GL and not a whole lot about X. And so there's, there's some weird quirks that make it unlike some of the other X extensions. Uh, the way it does, uh, the way it names contexts on the wire is, is a little funny. But it's all, it's all fairly well written. There's a spec for it. And you can, you can implement it correctly if you just often fail to. Um, the story for us really starts in about 1999. Um, the 3DFX cars were just starting to be a real thing and people wanted to run Quake. And in a very real sense, Quake drove a lot of the development of GL through this, uh, at least on Linux. Uh, so we already had Mesa, which is a functional replacement for a functional equivalent to OpenGL. Um, but the way it had worked before this point was the libgl API, the client library, sort of faked all the actual GL state. The X server didn't actually expose this extension. It just looked like there was this one that it looked like you were doing a lot of image uploads that were very, very large. And, but, and so all your rendering happened in software on the client side in, in sort of the old build of Mesa. And you can still do this if you want. And LLVM pipe actually does this still. Um, so in 1999, as this was becoming a thing that people really wanted to use Linux for graphics work, um, SGI open sourced some of their code that implemented OpenGL. They did implement, they did open a version of the sample implementation of OpenGL, but it never really caught on because we already had Mesa and Mesa was already good enough. But the GLX stuff, the parts in the X server that implements the wire protocol and, and managing these objects, we didn't have any code for that. So this was sort of where that starts. Um, the code is still out there. You can actually find copies of it still on, on SGI's website. And well, probably one of the best comments in it is this, which is really the story. Uh, you cannot implement swap buffers portably. Everything that that code did, the, the, and the entry point for swap buffers, it did all the validation of the arguments and made sure, yes, this is a context that should be able to swap stuff, and this is a vi it's doing so on a visual that's compatible with blah, blah, blah. Then we're just going to call this function pointer, and you'd better write what's behind that function pointer. Um, so that really is a complicated part, and so that's why we've had multiple direct rendering protocol revisions. Is over time we've had to change how we do buffer swaps and how we do getting the bits onto the screen. Um, so when we got GLX at this point in time, the way that the renderer built, so that you, you have to have a renderer on both sides, right? You have to have a thing that actually draws the commands. Um, on the, sorry, there, it was basically a, a con, an, an if defs magic build of Mesa that took its software renderer, loaded it inside the X server, and it was called GL Core. Um, so all your indirect context, which is the thing that you normally get if you don't have hardware acceleration, all your indirect context were going through this software GL core path. At about the same time, um, people started wanting to do actual hardware acceleration and make direct contexts really work. And so the DRI project started around this time as well, uh, led by a company called Precision Insight, who were then bought out by VA Linux at some point. 
Um, and they got a funding from SGI and Red Hat and a couple of other people to work on doing hardware enablement and doing 3D drivers for this hardware. So this is when we got the 3DFX DRI driver, we got the i810 driver, the Matrox G200 and so on. And by 2000, in X386 4.0, the GLX code had been merged. You actually got GLX support as part of your server build in X386 3.3, that wasn't there. It's kind of surprising to me. I, I remember 3.3 and I didn't realize that that wasn't there. Um, and 4.0 also changed the driver model that X386 was using. It used to be you had sort of one X server binary per driver. For every single graphics chip that you might want to run on, you had a different X server binary. Well, this makes multi-head really hard if you have multiple GPUs in the same system because one, at that time, we didn't really have the concept of multiple outputs on one pipe, at least not on PC class hardware. So it was impossible to do multi-head if all of your if if one X server can only drive one chip and can only drive one vendor's chip if you only had you know an ATI card and a matrox card next to each other you could run X servers on both but you couldn't run them as one so X364 changed the driver model so that there was a core that was common to among all the drivers and, uh, and then individual drivers were loaded like like any other kind of plugin like a like DL open but not actually deal open, and I'll get to that in a second. So, direct contexts. In order to make direct contexts work, you have to negotiate the resources on the graphics card and make sure that the client and the server don't stomp on each other. The way DRI1, X386 DRI uh, is the, the extension name in the protocol, the way it did that was approximately the simplest thing that could possibly work there was a thing called the S area, it was a shared area, which is just a little memory mapped chunk that the DRM driver provided that starts with a lock, a mutex, and a clip list, and a bunch of other stuff afterwards. The clip list is, if you have multiple windows on the screen, where they overlap, it, you have to know, okay, well, this rectangle I can't draw to because there's another window already. Well, the X server is the only thing that knows that information. So when the window tree changes, when, when you move, drag a window around the screen, the X server would grab the lock on the S area, update the clip list for any 3D windows that were affected by moving that around, and then drop the lock. The reverse happened on the client side. You grab the lock before you go to do swap buffers. You read out the clip list to make sure that you are painting things where you expect to be painting them and then release them. Note that this means that a misbehaving client can deadlock the server. If, it, if you halt somewhere in the driver with that lock held, the X server will never run again because it will try to take that lock and just block forever. Or by misbehaving, we mean stop the GP. Where by misbehaving, Eric points out, we mean you stop the GL program in GDB and now you can't type into the X server that's running the GDB session <laughs> because, yeah, that's, that, that, was, that was pretty priceless. It did suck. Um, you also have to do memory management. You have to know where the front buffer is. The front buffer is the thing that's being scanned out. The back buffer is the, the area that you're drawing into that's going to contain your next frame. The depth buffer, which contains, okay, well, these triangles are at these depths in the scene, so I don't have to compute them in the right order. I can just look, ha paint them as though they're in the scene, and the hardware will either draw them or not if the depth works out. The X server sets that up. In the, user, in the user mode setting model, and X386 at this point is, this is all way predates kernel mode setting. So the X server, basically the way that all the drivers ended up implementing it, you kind of pre-allocated chunks for, well, my front buffer is this big, depth buffer is right next to it, back buffer is right next to it, depth buffer is right next to it. You have some more memory for textures, chop, and then all your pix maps for 2D acceleration are in the rest of memory totally set up statically at server initialization time, which means that resizing the display, if you plug in a new display and, and want to get a bigger, uh, bigger resolution, there was no mechanism for resizing there. You kind of had to pick things as big as they would ever be up front, and that's why we had the virtual lines in, in xorg.conf. You had to know, you had to tell it, this is how big I'm ever going to get. 
It also meant that since you had this sort of artificial split between the memory usable for textures and the memory usable for pix maps, that you were choosing which of these you wanted to perform reasonably. Um, inevitably, any choice you make is going to make someone unhappy. It also meant that, um, oh, I had, I had another piece here, I'll let it pass. But it did work, and it got things on the screen, and you could play Quake, and at 1999, that was the thing to be doing. Note that nothing really happens in, in DRI for a bit. Like, from 2000 to 2003, we, mostly, we got new, uh, some new drivers, we got some new feature work on, on GL itself, but there was really not a lot in GLX. EGL 1.0, which is the, the embedded version of the spec, um, it was sort of there for working on embedded devices where there might not be an entire window system like X present. If you talk to EGL, this sort of abstracted model instead. Uh, that started in 2003. Uh, we never really got an implementation of it in Mesa until much, much later, but at least at the time you could see, okay, well we want this abstraction of uh, separating knowledge of the window system from the GL. Then things started getting fun. This is about when I started hacking on stuff. XGL came out in 2004, and XGL was a nested X server that ran as a client of a real backing X server, that was your XORG or X386. Um, it ran full, usually full screen. It was itself a direct rendered client and then turn around and in internally did all of its rendering using OpenGL or falling down to software. Um, what this lets you do, among other things, is it lets you write GL-based compositors efficiently because now you can, uh, since all your rendering is happening in GL, you could do that inside the X server. Um, and this is when Compiz was born. In 2005, we redid how we built X. It used to be this gigantic pile of junk where in order to build the X server, you also had to build all the client libraries and all of the demo applications. And usually you, you know, made, it made it very difficult for even de dedicated, uh, devoted people to work on because you could build just the server, but you had to go hack the make files to do it. The, the X, I make file, con no, I make config files, I guess. So we blew it up in 2005. We kind of chopped everything out into multiple pieces. Um, and at the same time, we changed the module format that the server would load. The server used to load just about anything you wanted. Um, it didn't use, everyone know here what libdl is? Anybody not know? Raise your hand. Um, it's how you load plugins. It's the, the, the runtime interface to the dynamic linker. You, you point at a shared library and, and tell the operating system, load this into memory for me. And now I want to be able to grab symbols out of it and call them or, and, and, and use them that way. So this is how you implement plugins. This is how you implement drivers. Um, X wasn't using that. X was using something else that was functionally equivalent in some ways. Uh, it, it, cross -platform it was cross-platform portable, which was really Proprietary interesting. Modules. The idea being that you would want to be able to build a driver on one operating system and run it on another because there was a period of time where it looked like things other than Linux were interesting. Uh, never ended up really getting used. So it knew how to parse ELF modules, and ELF object files, load them itself into memory, do the relocation processing. So all of that was running in your set UIDX server and we had this open coded everything. Had to port it to every new platform by ourselves. Uh, also had support for loading a.out and c off modules because those are binary formats you want to support on Linux. Um, we decided that was terrible and we chucked it and we replaced it with DL loader which just uses libdl like everything else. Um, so it actually made it possible to use normal shared libraries as plugins within the server and also all of our drivers are now shared libraries. By 2006, uh, the compositing world had, we, we, we'd noticed that we, we, well, sorry. Compiz had existed for a while and there was finally formally a spec for the texture from PixMap extension, which is a GLX extension. GLX itself contains a notion of extensions of being able to add additional features to 
GLX, and that texture from PixMap does what it says on the box. Name a PixMap in the X window system and get its contents into a texture so that your client can draw it. And this works with composite because the way composite changes drawing in the X server is composite instead a redirected window, instead of drawing directly to the screen, draws to an off-screen surface that you can then that is a pix map and you can name it. Between these two things, okay, well I can redirect drawing off screen into a pix map and then I can get the bits from that pix map into a texture. Cool, now I can write a GL compositor. This was real easy to do for XGL because all the bits were in the same space. It just represented pix maps as textures internally up front. Xorg did not have this. So we did a thing called AIGLX, and I wish people would stop saying it. Uh, I invented that acronym, and I really wish people would stop mentioning it. Uh, yes, thank you for inventing that acronym for us. Do what I can, man. Um, AI there simply meaning accelerated indirect. We had direct contexts that were accelerated, but the, your indirect contexts were still this software GL core build that I mentioned earlier. We taught the X server how to load DRI drivers the way libgl does. That's your fault. It sure is. That's a horrible idea. The reason why, and the reason why we did it is exactly the same reason as to make XGL work, because now you have the 3D driver and the pix maps that you're talking about in the same address space, and you don't need to, uh, so now the texture from pix map part of this is not you know, copying data from the client out to, from the server out to the client and then back in. It's just pointer. Oh, it's this part of video memory. There's my pix map. Go, go texture out of it. Um, because again, at this point in life, there was not kernel mode setting. We didn't have that level of memory management in the kernel, so we couldn't. We didn't have any convenient handle to pass between the X server and X clients to say this pix map is this kernel object, and we're going we're gonna to just refer to it opaquely. None of that existed, so AIGLX was there to kind of bolt this all together and get GL-based compositing in your X server in one process. Horrifying thing, and I, I apologize, uh, but it does work. Well, it's got Comfy's running on Fedora. Pardon? It's got Comfy's running on Fedora. Yeah, it got Comfy's running on Fedora, which was a thing. <laughs> uh, Everybody wanted wobbly windows, man. <laughs> so that made it work, but it, it, it had, you, you could kind of see the ugly underbelly happening there, which is that uh, DRI1, again, because it, it had sort of this fixed layout of the world, uh, there was no way to tell a direct rendering client, hey, don't, you, your window's been redirected. Instead of drawing to the screen, draw somewhere else off screen. So when you ran Compiz and then ran a GL application inside of it, you would see your gear spinning, you'd grab the window, and you could see the window wobbling with the gears punching straight through where they were before, continuing to animate quite happily while the rest of it just kind of, you see the frame wobbling all over the screen. And then once you release the window, the X server is finally told, okay, update the window position, and then the gears would snap to their new location and you'd see an old copy of the gears up here until you painted something else over it or your compass refreshed again. Um, so GL, direct GL applications would work, but they kind of, you would poke through and they, they weren't really integrated with the whole, the whole thing. So uh, this is a bit of a problem. Lots of applications would like to use GL. Firefox has WebGL now. Uh, you would like to be able to run GL applications and use GL to get the bits on the screen. In order to do this, we really had to have some notion of kernel-based memory management. And so KMS came along. Now we have kernel mode setting, kernel output setup, and that has to all live in the kernel because the kernel's the only thing that knows where the frame buffer is. That memory has to go somewhere, has to be allocated by the kernel instead of being allocated by the X server. So it's got to go. So that all has to get lowered down. Keith is squinting at me, and yes, I know this is you could do it some other way. Oh yeah, I, 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 it would be ugly, and I, I hacked it up at one point with a driver that would tell the kernel, by the way, your frame buffer's here. Um, I, don't I don't recommend it. Um, 
and DRI2 came along at about the same time. This was actually only five years ago, seriously, right. six, I guess. Um, I went back and looked, and the first KMS driver was I-915, and that got merged into the kernel in November of 2008, which is surprisingly recent in my mind. DRI2 then is the, it was a new pro, a new GL, a new extension that sat next to GL and kind of replaced DRI1 that did the obvious thing of instead of pre-allocating memory in this, you know, upfront way, we assume that you've got enough of kernel allocation smarts that you can pass handles to these objects around back and forth between the client and the server, and you talk in terms of those, you don't talk in terms of fixed locations on the screen. The S area went away, so now no longer could a misbehaving GL app lock, block out your server. Life got much nicer. That last bit, SWS DRI.SO, up until this point, we, we did the modular X build, um, but you were still building the software GL core. Uh, and the way you had to do that was at configure time, you pointed the server build to a copy of the Mesa source. And it did a symlink farm to get all the bits into the X server tree and then dropped out a, a build of the software renderer that way. This is super fragile. It meant that you were sort of this lockstep. You had sort of this lockstep intera interaction between which version of Mesa and which server would be mutually buildable. Um, every time you wanted to refactor how the source was laid out in Mesa, you broke the X server build. So in 2008, we also got what I call SWSDRI.SO for lack of a, of a clever name, because that's what the driver's called. And what that does is it looks a lot like a DRI driver. You load it using approximately the same interface as you load hardware DRI drivers, but instead of being built at the X server build time in this weird, horrible symlinky fashion, it drops out of the Mesa build. So now you can build whatever Mesa you want against whatever X server you want from sort of this point forward and not have to worry about this horrible inter interlocking. I feel like I'm skipping. Um, 2011, we got Glamour. Uh, Glamour is a acceleration layer for 2D X drivers that translates X rendering to GL. And Eric did a talk earlier in the week about it. That's uh, very, very cool, and shame on you all for missing it. Um, as I recall, a lot of the reason why that first existed was that on <coughs> somebody's GPU, you had a binary GL driver and a binary 2D driver, and it was faster to re-implement the 2D driver to translate to their GLES than to actually use their 2D driver, and this was absolutely not a PowerVR chip. Um, no, it wasn't made by PowerVR. It wasn't, right. It was not made by PowerVR. Simply looked a lot like one. Um, but this is actually a really cool idea, and, and XGL had kind of hinted at this earlier, because it means we have to do GL driver initialization anyway. For new chips, we have to make OpenGL work. We're already writing DRI drivers. The acceleration process of handing command buffers down to the card looks a whole lot like the same for the 2D and 3D paths. Let's just do it once in the GL driver and not have to write 2D acceleration anymore. It's sort of the, the theory here. And we're pretty close. We can actually make that work. And this, this, this guy running here is, in fact, all the pixels on the screen right now have been drawn with Glamour. Neat. Um, the, the inconvenient part there is that we're still loading DRI drivers. We're not loading OpenGL driver. We're not, we're not talking to an OpenGL implementation. We're talking to a DRI driver, which has this big dispatch table at the front of it that where all of your function pointers slot in for here's where 3 GL vertex goes. Here's where setting texture images go. So now these two things are fighting. You have any indirect GL contexts that are coming in have their own GL context and, and dispatch into that. And then you have another GL context for 2D rendering. And it's not merely enough to use the GL call to set contexts. 
you also have to explicitly know about how the DRI dispatch table works and, and manually fix it up. So Glamour has this hack or had this hack to reset the DRI dispatch table on its way out every single time so that your indirect GL would still work. Um, ugly. Uh, in a real sense, the, the detail of how what DRI drivers are between libgl and the DRI driver, that should be a maze of detail. That shouldn't be something that the X server knows about. So I fixed that. Uh, in 2013, um, I ported the indirect renderer to GL directly. So now it just calls libgl like any other X app, like any other client application. And this blew away, a, I don't remember how many, what percentage, but something between 40 and 60,000 lines of code uh, because it's, OpenGL is a really big API service and every single entry point that you might be able to hit over the wire, you have to generate these little function stubs for it. Well, we still generate function stubs for them, but they're much, much smaller. Um, I don't remember what percentage that is of the, of the GLX code, but it was not insignificant. Most of it. Yeah. Um, we also got a couple of new DRI, uh, a new DRI, third one this time, and maybe this one will, this one will stick. The big difference between DRI 3 and DRI 2 is that in DRI, as far as I'm concerned, is that in DRI 2, swap buffers was a round trip. It was a, it was a, a request that required a reply. So you would post a, a swap buffers, and you would block until it came, the, the reply came back. I think I'm getting that right. Um, you can do that asynchronously now. You can, you can kind of throw a swap at the, at the server and later you'll get an event back, but you're not blocked on waiting for that for the reply to come back. Um, other than that, DRI 3 looks very similar to DRI 2 in, in sort of a conceptual level. There, there's some details about uh, how objects are named in their life cycles that are a bit different, but that's the big win and because this makes GLX gears much, much faster, which everybody uses. <laughs> To measure it's performance, a it is the. It's not a benchmark. It is absolutely not a benchmark, and it will not, and it will not ever be. Um, but this is why Nouveau always looked so much slower than Nvidia was DRI two was having to round trip. So where are we going in the future? Um, we have now, as I've said, we have the ability to run an X server that uses GL for every piece of rendering is really, really nice because it means I might never need to write a 2D driver again. And we've actually, and Eric has bolted this up into uh, a generic mode set, driver called mode setting that for the 2D driver that does not care whether you have an NVIDIA or ATI or Intel chip under you, it just says, oh, you've got the kernel mode setting API coming out of the iOctal on this, on this device node. Cool, good enough, I know how to drive those because they're really very similar. Um, so whatever KMS device is under you will come up on it. There will be an OpenGL underneath you that is probably going to be EGL. We're get, we, we still have a little bit of awareness that it is a DRI driver that we're loading. That's how we, we get the driver into the X server address space. We can make that go away. We can have it just call down to EGL underneath us and say, that's we're, we're getting an EGL surface, and that's good enough. At this point, we've basically detached the X server from the hardware, which means that we no longer need to use the X server as the hardware, as the hardware display server. You can run something else like Mirror or Wayland or whatever you like. As long as there's an EGL underneath it, we can bring an X server up. Awesome. This means that now we can stop adding features to X because we just need to add them to EGL and, and kind of glue them together through into GLX, but we no longer need to like, when you add new swap buffers, you just have to write that to EGL. Um, so that should make the X server maintenance problem much less of a problem, which I'm super enthused about because I've been maintaining it for about eight years and I'm tired of it. <laughs> Someday you'll actually start to stop being a newbie. I know. Someday I will stop being a newbie. Keith is allowed to say that because Keith predates X. <laughs> there are some really cool features that can come out of uh, new OpenGL things that can, that can make the whole drawing everything, drawing all of X through GL. We can make that fast. We're within a factor of 20 for some of the really slow paths and we just haven't tried very hard for the, and that's for things like core text, not this pretty stuff, um, but the, the X term anti-aliased uh, kinds of text 
we're pretty slow at that. We're way slower than software. Uh, but we can get much, much faster if we want to. So it would be nice. And for things like copy area and solid fills, things where there's not a lot of, of GL banging that you have to do to get the rendering command, we're already within 10% at least of performance of the current acceleration code into the 2D drivers. So with only a little bit more work, we can get the performance to the same level with a utterly generic driver that just knows about GL and we no longer have to write 2DX acceleration. Really sweet. That's pretty much where I had, where I've run out of things to talk about. There's some other projects that can go out in, in terms of making the GLX better, but uh, they should be less and less relevant as time goes on. So if anybody has any questions, I will happily take them. Yeah. So how do I get my wobbly windows back? <laughs> you can still run Compass, I'm pretty sure. Uh, how do you get the, how do I get my wobbly windows back? You can still run Compass, I'm pretty sure. I think it's just not maintained by anybody at the moment. Um, I test it, sadly. You test, oh, <coughs> Keith tested Compits and it works. Make sure presenting the RI tree works with it, of course. I like the windows that folded into paper airplanes and flew away. Yeah, that one, <laughs> the, the, the folding up and the, fold, the windows folding up and flying away was really cool. Actually, if I'm going to do with my, with my I guess I should uh, promote GNOME hat on, uh, there is a GNOME shell extension for wobbly windows. It's pretty poor performing. I mean, it is, it may be poor, poorly performing, but you are asking it to draw way more than it otherwise would, so I'm sorry that you did that. Maybe don't do that. No, it's probably trying to execute too much JavaScript. <laughs> that could be too. Anybody else? Yes. Question was when do we get this level of hardware agnosticism into the X server as something that you can that you can consume? Um, I would pretty much say one standard deviation per release. If it wasn't in 1.16, I would think that'd be one standard deviation unlikely. If it wasn't the next one, it'd be two standard deviations unlikely. So, pretty odds are pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we can get at least the the level of quality that we have on Radeon today working on 1.16. So and so. So getting it to a, you, can, you could replace everything with this if you wanted, but it wouldn't necessarily be feature or performance compatible. Um, 1.16 seems pretty likely, which will be, I guess, six months from now. 1.15 just came out in December, so we're on sort of a six month tick, yeah? Um, do the does the device driver support EGL yet? Yeah. Mesa has EGL support for at this point for ev for at this point all the drivers that it has left, um, which is everything with a DRI two port and so everything that's KMS, uh, Intel, Novo, Radeon. There's all an EGL support there. Um, the, closed the closed source drivers. Um, Nvidia I think just added EGL support to their desktop binary to their desktop binary driver. They've had it in the Tegra driver for a long time. It's Sorry? It's only. It is 32 bit only at the moment because of a really, really stupid thing in the Kronos headers about type depths, actually. Uh, if you, just as an aside, if you're ever writing a project in the future and you feel the need to invent your own type depths, I will hurt you. <laughs> just use standard int.h, please. Um, so yeah, most embedded devices at this point, including most of the Android drivers, do implement something that's either EGL or very, very similar to it. So all the open drivers do. We've got at least a couple of clo one closed driver that does, and presumably, if this is important enough for uh, for AMD to want to support, they'll add it to Catalyst. Um, that said, there are things that are missing from EGL. There are there are some workstation features like stereo support. Um, accumulation buffers, bits that are in GLX but not in EGL yet. So 
if you're using a workstation application that relies on those features, you may have to wait until, you may have to still run Catalyst for a while. And that's still going to stay there. The ability to have, to, to run any driver you want will be there. It's just the generic driver is going to get a lot more capable. Um, anyone else have one or I'll answer yours last? Go ahead. When do I think X Wayland will be merged into the server? Uh, again, 116 would be lovely, but I'm not super confident on that. 117 seems a bit more likely, uh, and we'll call that, you know, that's again Christmas time next of uh, 2014. So in this year, it'd be nice to have something in there. Um, whether that's going to land, sort of depends on how much typing we can get done in that in the interval. It does work at the moment. It's just a matter of integration and testing and making sure that we really hammer out all the details. Thank you very much, Adam. Um